Hey guys, it's Lady and welcome back to the series of videos where I break down everything about our favorite Genshin characters. From stories unlocked via raising companionship levels, to voice lines said by other characters, to appearances in event quests, and so on. In other words, whether you don't have a specific character, can't be bothered to raise their companionship levels, need a refresher, or just want the basic TLDR of a character's text, then this ultimate lore guide is for you. Today we'll be covering my first ever limited 5 star, the one I go another constellation for with every single rerun, the Lord of Geo himself, Zhongli. So this first section will be a bit different from all my other lore guides so far, solely because Zhongli's nature as an Archon means he has much more relevance to Tabat's overall history and lay of the land. So we'll be discussing much more than just his companionship unlock stories here, all in the effort to provide as much context as possible when we get to his in-game appearances that we'll discuss later. But yeah, so speaking of Zhongli's role as the literal Geo Archon, that's far from the only title he's been given throughout the many thousands of years. In fact, Zhongli has more titles than anyone I've come across in Genshin's lore so far, and yes, that's with Mr. Worldwide included. So let's start breaking down those titles, starting with the ones even prior to the establishment of the Seven and the seat he take among them. So what's estimated to be nearly 6,000 years ago, Morax, the god of Geo, descended, raised Mount Tianhong, and brought prosperity to the people there via the mining of ore. Also sorry, just one more thing to preface in this section. So Zhongli's name this far back in history is actually unknown, since he was given the name Morax only after he joined the Seven. I'll discuss this in a little more depth later, but overall the main point of all this is that I'll still be referring to Zhongli as Morax here, since there's no better choice we can go off of as of now. So it was not long after this time that the goddess of dust, Guizhong, allied with Morax and created the Guizhong Ballista for their protection. She and her people went on to cultivate the area north of Mount Tianhong in what would come to be known as the Guili Plains. It was here that this god of dust and god of geo, along with another god by the name of Marchosius, combined their settlements and established the Guili Assembly, which brought prosperity to all. But sadly, they were eventually met with tragedy when the Archon War broke out. A fierce battle raged from the Dihua Marsh all the way to the Guili Plains, and though Morax eventually emerged as the victor, it was not without a terrible cost. Guizhong perished in the fighting, and the Guili Plains was devastated by a massive flood. With their home destroyed, Morax and Marchosius led the people south to what is now known as Liyue Harbor. Morax, the prime of the Adepti, also began forging contracts with his fellow brethren at this time, Ganyu being one of the first. He left the budding harbor's protection in the hands of these Adepti, while he laid waste to their enemies, such vanquished gods including Osile, the Qi, and Xiao's former master. Morax buried their remains beneath the rocks of the earth, but the consciousness of gods are immortal. So fueled by the lamentations and rage of their defeat, their remnants seeped like poison into the mortal world and caused all sorts of calamities, from plagues to hateful demons. To deal with these calamities, Morax called upon the Yakshas, the most martial in temperament and prowess of the Adepti. Now, as the Archon War was wrapping up all across Tevat, Morax emerged as one of the victors and took his divine seat among the Seven. The first Seven were a diverse lot, but the one commonality they all held was the burden of guiding humanity according to their respective ideals. 
For Morax, nothing was and is more important than contracts. From the simplest monetary exchanges to the ancient laws he set down at the city's founding. Each of these first centered upon this concept of contracts, the most important term hinging on if any party were to renege or to go back on their word, they would suffer the wrath of the rock. This strict order was what created and sustained the vibrant lifeblood of Liyue Harbor's commerce. Merchants revere the Geo Archon and hold themselves to the highest standard in honoring their contracts, which includes everything from invoices, deadlines, and shipping destinations. And since their founding, the Liyue Chasing has punished violators with no mercy, not just to protect market efficiency, but to honor Rex Lapis. But Zhongli's titles don't stop here. As lovers of opera and storytelling know of his onstage presence as the warrior god, who was the all-conquering defender of their harbor. Meanwhile, historians call him the god of history, since he is the eldest of the seven and possesses the near-infinite amount of knowledge that comes with the territory of being 6,000 years old. But most of all, the people of Liyue are proud that their god has actively engaged with and walked among them throughout the many centuries. I'll discuss some of these instances detailed in the Rex Incognito series, along with the unexpected reason for Zhongli's aversion to certain seafood later on in this video. But returning to his status as the eldest of the seven, Zhongli can still remember the moment the last Archon of the initial seven took their seat, as this was what brought the period of the Warring Gods officially to an end. Many of the Seven's titles have changed hands since then, until at last, only he and Barbados remained of the original Seven. Like what was said earlier, the Seven were a diverse lot, and Morax and Barbados couldn't be further apart in personality. In fact, the first post-war visit of the carefree Barbados to Liyue was cause for alarm to Morax. The god of Geo assumed things were dire indeed and was ready to lend any assistance he could, but instead what he was met with was a bottle of dandelion wine tossed his way. His first impression was that Barbados was the entirely irresponsible type for forsaking his duties to Mondstadt just to deliver a single bottle of wine. And yet, the Anima Archon continued to visit, and eventually? Liyue Harbor became the location where the first seven would gather together. Fast forwarding to present day, and Zhongli still remembers how those first wines tasted. But the world has changed so much since then. Five of the first seven have departed, and all that was once familiar exists solely as just memories. Even the hardest rocks are worn down after 3,000 years. But what really kickstarted Zhongli's test for Liyue? Well, you see, one drizzly day in the city, he overheard a merchant tell his workers that they could now call it a day since they have finished their duties. As innocuous as this phrase may seem, this truly was an unexpected epiphany moment for the Lord of Geo, who took pause amidst the bustling crowd wondering for the first time in his many long years if he had already finished his duties. And now is a great time to transition into Zhongli's appearances in-game, starting with Act 1 of the Liyue Archon Quest, where he's cooking up a big secret test for his people. We're first introduced to Zhang Li, a consultant of the Wangsheng Funeral Parlor, via Child's Connections. The funeral parlor's job is to organize burials to make sure those who pass on can do so in peace. And as for Mr. Zhang Li, he specializes in the proper procedure for seeing off an adeptus, one that has been basically lost to history. 
Nevertheless, he is disappointed that the Qixing has made no attempt to respect this tradition, which is especially egregious in this case, considering that Rex Lapis was the prime of all Adepti. Traveler agrees to help Zhongli prepare for the ceremony since this is the only way to get access to the Exuvia's body. Then we receive some advanced funds from Child, courtesy of the Fatui, which isn't at all suspicious. Then we get going on those preparations. Tagging along with Zhongli, we really get to see firsthand his whole problem with grasping the true worth of money. Given that he never looks at the price tag of anything, yet is always willing to pay full price for everything. He also has a vast amount of knowledge regarding all things pertaining to Li Wei's local specialties, which impresses even the most experienced merchants. With his essentially insider knowledge, Zhongli guides us through the very particular process of testing Noctilucious Jade, Silk Flowers, and other samples of items as is necessary for the rite of parting. This is all to make sure we're getting the highest quality we can possibly get. On top of all that, we also learn about the different visits the Geo Archon has made to the city over the many years via these merchant stories, all of whom clearly revere Rex Lapis. For example, Merchant Bolai gives us the silk flowers free of charge when he hears they're for Rex Lapis, since he wouldn't be nearly as profitable nowadays if it weren't for the Geo Archon's poems praising his wares. Now, as an interesting breather in the middle of all this shopping, Zhongli sends us off to borrow a cleansing bell from his old friend Madame Ping, who we soon learn just happens to be an adeptus. But overall, we don't face any trouble with the preparations until our trip to Boo Boo Pharmacy. Chi Chi won't sell us any everlasting incense since we don't have a prescription. I guess we form a sort of contract with her though, in that she agrees to help us if we help her out first. In this case, she wants us to find a Coca Goat, a legendary Adepta Beast, apparently. Oddly enough though, Jungli is not familiar with such a creature, but we go off of Chi Chi's leads and head over to where she last spotted one, near the Guizhong Ballista. Now, even though this contraption is thousands of years old, Jungli is able to perfectly repair it, scope and all, much to these treasure hoarders' chagrin. But unfortunately, we're still unable to find any coca goats, which causes Zhongli to feel especially apologetic towards Chi Chi for not being able to uphold his end of the contract. Though thankfully, whatever guilt he may have had is thrown out the window when it's revealed that the very forgetful zombie girl accidentally confused coconut milk with coca goat milk. Speaking of Coca Goat, Gan Yu, the secretary of the Qi Sing, extends an official invitation to the Jade Chamber to us, so we part ways with Zhongli for a while, agreeing to meet up again at Dihua Marsh after our visit. Now, to follow strict tradition of the rite of parting, we must find wild glaze lilies next, which have the strongest fragrance. We don't have much luck with this though until we come across Ganyu again, though this time in the wild. She, like many others, is happy that she's able to pay her respects to Rex Lapis, especially so since he was the one whom she admired and strived to be like all this time. Now, upon returning to the city, we part ways with Zhongli again, now that tensions between the Qixing and Adepti are about to ignite. We don't see him again until the very end where it's revealed that everything was just a big test staged by the very Geo Archon himself. All parties involved exceeded his expectations, though he was most impressed by the Qixing and how they took advantage of the power vacuum and seized control of Li Wei's future. This outcome truly was what he wanted all along, 
though he didn't think the mortals would be so ready for a world without his guidance. Liyue no longer needs his divine power in this new age of humanity. Now as for this contract to end all contracts, Zhonghui hands over his gnosis to Signora as fulfillment of the contract he made with the Tsaritsa. This all having been made even prior to everything that has gone down in Liyue. But what possibly could equal the divine powers of a gnosis? No matter how we try to view this, Zhongli seems comfortable that this is the right decision, and he won't speak another word about the details due to said contract. Now moving on to the first of Zhongli's specific character quests, Act 1 begins on the classy Pearl Galley. We catch him right in the middle of a conversation with many of Liyue's Wei's top historians, the topic having to do with the Geo Archon and what his original intent must have been in minting the first Mora. Zhongli believes that the Geo Archon just simply wished to establish a convenient measurement to prove a contract's value. There was no outstanding foresight or symbolic reason that Morax created this currency, like these researchers are posing. Zhongli's fortitude to question the common historical narrative leads the female at the table, Wan Yan, to request a private conversation with him. Here she asks Zhongli if he believes all the gods who met their defeat via Morax were evil. By the way, notice that she does not refer to him as Rex Lapis, as most from Liyue would do. But anyway, thanks to her research, she's found that Havria, the goddess of salt, was a kind god who was unjustly slain by Morax. As we're discussing this, it turns out a Snezhnayan diplomat has recently paid for private consultation services from Zhongli via the Wangsheng Funeral Parlor. He needs his expertise for his archaeological expedition, so seeing this as a good opportunity to continue the conversation we were just having, Zhongli invites the female researcher and traveler along. The first stop is Guyun Stone Forest, the place where Rex Lapis hurled down massive stone spears to pin down and defeat Osile during the Archon War. The entire geography as it is now is what erosion has left behind. Now long story short, the Snezhnayan is frustrated over finding nothing worth of value, while Wanyan only appears to have knowledge on the goddess of salt. So we head to Salterai instead. Zhongli helps Wanyan unlock mechanisms that not even herself, with all her research into the goddess of salt, could figure out during her last visit here. Now, before we head into the ruins, Zhongli proposes a contract between Wanyan and the Snezhnayan so we don't have a repeat of their squabbling over the inherent value of an artifact. Each of them will take turns selecting a piece to take with them, and so they accept seeing as Zhongli refuses to continue his consultation services otherwise. Another long story short, the Snezhnayan faces the wrath of the rock for his greed, which resulted in him breaching the contract. Zhongli deals out the punishment himself and confiscates the relic he selected. Then he finally requests that Wanyang be honest with her intentions as well, since she clearly isn't an archaeologist, otherwise she would know much more about everything in general. It turns out she's a descendant of Havria's people, who have passed down a story detailing how Morax killed her, leaving them godless and with no options but to assimilate into Liyue. She admits she's just trying to find proof of Morax's guilt, but since Zhongli can see how earnest she is, he agrees to take her further into the ruins. The final relics they come across are two pieces of a broken sword, which is apparently Havria's. From an archaeological standpoint though, this item counts as two different pieces, meaning Wanyan will only be able to take one as per the terms of the contract. 
It's here that she steals herself for punishment, since she refuses to leave without both pieces. Without this entire sword, she can't prove that Havria's defeat was just in trying to defend her people. The actual punishment she receives, though, is not a physical beating, but a mental one. Zhongli tells her the cruel truth of everything regarding Kavria, that she wasn't at all powerful like Wanyan and Havria's other descendants were led to believe. She was actually weak and small, and always avoided battle. But in such a long war, there's an endless amount of aggressors. She continued to make concession after concession, until at last, she had no lands left leaving Salterai as the final haven of her and her people. Wanyuan runs off in shock and disbelief, yet all that wasn't even the final blow. We finally find her at the tragic scene of Havria's demise. Her people, wishing to give her kind soul an easier way out during these dark times, murdered her themselves. But no matter how weak a god is, the power that flows from them when slain is too much for mortals to withstand, and thus we have the transformed human pillars of salt scattered all around the ruins. By the way, shouldn't this have been a well-documented thing since the Archon War? I still don't get how any of the Adepti were fooled regarding Rex Lapis's death, seeing as Liyue Harbor was perfectly fine after the Rite of Dissension, but I digress. The story quest wraps up at the top of one of the huge stone pillars in Guyun Stone Forest. Zhong Li believes the salt chalice and ruler we found in Havria's ruins should not return to Liyue, since things that are from the past should stay in the past. He has a lot to ruminate over now, considering everything we've just discussed on this brief journey. How will he be remembered as history goes on? Will it change and be revised as we just seen? How can he record the details so that the truth endures? He turns to the Traveler and shares how he's aware that they are not of this world, and he hopes that perhaps Liyue's history will always have a backup of sorts via the Traveler for when the time comes that Tevat is shaken by changing tides once again. Then finally, he sends Havria's relics to the bottom of the sea, where so many other bygone gods have been laid to rest. No matter what happens now, Zhongli supposes his legacy will be left to those in the future to debate. And now we've arrived at a unique something that no other character has in Genshin so far, and that's a second official character quest. This one starts off with an interesting referral from the Adventurer's Guild. Long story short, the client, the mining foreman Uncle Dai, has enlisted the help of a rock expert, and Paimon, not wanting to be outdone, makes sure Zhongli is brought along on our end. Zhongli and the other rock expert, Kunjun, take to each other quite well, Though it's quite interesting that there's a mortal who appears to be just as knowledgeable as the former Geo Archon. In fact, Kunjun has this crazy special skill that allows him to literally see through the eyes of Or. This is particularly handy for Uncle Dai's commission, since it turns out we're on a missing persons hunt for four miners who just up and vanished a couple days prior. Kunjun peers through the eyes of a nearby Corlapis and sees four miners following a young girl. As we follow the clues provided by Kunjun and Zhongli, which slowly lead us to Nantianmen, the young prodigy shares that he's actually been feeling very anxious lately. He can't remember much about what's going on, and actually has this feeling like he's forgotten to do something. Apparently, it has something to do with a type of ore called Dragonfall, but we're pulled out of those thoughts when we finally find one of the missing miners collapsed on the road. Once the miner is confirmed to be in stable condition, and Kunjun heads off on his own to rest, Zhongli explains what Dragonfall is, that it's unique to all other ore, 
since unlike those that are formed under high temperature environments over time, Dragonfall is produced slowly from elemental reactions. There used to be much more of it thousands of years ago due to the colossal battles of the past, but it has otherwise been mined into obscurity even centuries prior to this day. This is why it's rather odd that a citizen like Kunjun would have an interest in this ore. Anyway, the next morning we're led to the huge tree in Nantianmen. The stone tablet right outside appears to jog something in Kunjun's head, but that's right when Zhongli leads us to a large tunnel under the tree. Here we find the missing miners, who continue to press on digging non-stop despite their obvious exhaustion. They even hostily approach us, though they're no match against Zhongli's beefy shield. Unbeknownst to him though, the little girl manifests right from behind and launches a surprise attack that Kunjun thankfully shields us from, though that doesn't stop all three of us from being sucked into the ominous seal. In this domain, we face off against a humongous and very angry aged Aha, who apparently has much to settle with Morax, seeing how he's been trapped down here for centuries thanks to the former Geo Archon's doing. Traveler and Zhongli eventually subdue this aged Aha resurgent, thanks to Kunjun imbuing us with his own power. You see, this young man has actually been briefly taken over by the benevolent conscious that still remains of Ajdaha. Sadly, rock erodes over time, and it's this erosion that caused Ajdaha's consciousness to fade, so much so that he could no longer recognize friend from foe and forgot all about the battles he fought together with Morax and the Adepti in defending Liyue. We return to the surface where Zhongli and Ajdaha reminisce before the latter's good conscience fades once again. All these millennia ago, Morax heard the voice of a blind geo-elemental being who wished to see surface life. So by contract, Morax gave him sight and allowed him to live on the surface with mortals as long as he helped to protect Liyue. But erosion unfortunately set in. Meanwhile, the overexploitation of mined ore caused great disturbances to the ley lines and, in turn, brought Ajdaha much suffering. Then finally, on that fateful day when Ajdaha lashed out and attacked the human miners, Morax had no choice but to step in. This is one of those legendary battles that birthed Dragonfall, though in this present moment, Ajdaha's good consciousness finally recalls how there was still a part of the great Geo Dragon who held a fondness for the mortals and Morax, and so he willingly let himself be sealed away underground. Lastly, now that Ajdaha has learned that Zhongli has given up his position as the Geo Archon, he wonders what will happen if he were to reawaken a second time to which Zhongli can only reply that Liyue must defend itself then. Even now, in this godless nation of men, he was still once their god, so he ought to witness their rise and fall. Ajdaha's consciousness finally departs once more, as Zhongli ruminates over how personally sealing away an old friend is just one form of erosion he himself has endured. But on another note, old habits die hard, since Traveler finally takes the opportunity to ask Zhongli what he knows about Danesleaf, Conria, and the cataclysm that occurred 500 years ago, but is unfortunately met with no answers, since Zhongli apparently made a contract regarding this, even prior to all the events actually happening, which is a sort of sus explanation. But anyway, now that Zhongli's main quests are covered, we can now move on to his appearances in patch-specific event quests, the first not happening until patch 2.1's Moonlight Merriment. So right during the final scenes of the festivities, Guoba, the consciousness that remains of the old stove god Marchosius, remember back when we were discussing the Guili assembly and everything, runs up to Zhongli nearby. 
Even though he can't actually remember Morax, he can still tell what is familiar. The Moon Chase Festival never fails to stir up evocative feelings of nostalgia, so Zhongli, Madame Ping, and Guaba spend the rest of the night enjoying each other's company at Wanmin Restaurant. Then, when Lantern Right swings by again in 2.4, Traveler is seeking some of Zhongli's advice and is directed to Third Round Knockout, where the former Geo Archon is clearly enjoying his retirement, this time with Hu Tao and Shanling's company. Once the two girls are so kind to take their leave, we ask if Zhongli has any ideas to convince Ke Qing to take a break from overseeing everything about the firework preparations. Since he doesn't know her too well, plus lecturing her will likely have the opposite effect, Zhongli suggests we try a more subtle, indirect approach, such as crafting a story that will resonate with her while also conveying our intended message. And so we go around helping Ke Qing with her tasks, all the while getting to know her better and learning more about her from co-workers and friends. A few days later, Traveler and Paimon slowly weave together a tale, while the former Geo Archon, with thousands of years of lived experience, offers his two cents here and there. Clearly, some of the lessons resonate with him, such as learning the importance of delegating tasks to others instead of doing everything by oneself. But overall, with his encouragement to use the things we've heard and learned these past couple days, we're able to craft a story that we can be proud of and confident in its ability to reach Ke Qing. Finally, once the big fireworks show begins, we get to see our two favorite Wangsheng funeral parlor employees wholesomely enjoying the magnificent view together. But now we've arrived at the final section of this video, that being Papa Gio's thoughts on the other characters and vice versa, as well as some general miscellaneous things we haven't talked about yet. So I thought we'd start off with the two playable characters who signed a contract with him when he was still Rex Lapis. So if you're unaware, Zhong Li is the one who freed Xiao from his forced servitude to a particularly cruel god during the Archon War. Morax also gifted him the very name he goes by now as a sign of compassion, so Xiao agreed to a contract with Rex Lapis out of sheer gratitude. To this day, he still faithfully fulfills his duty in slaying demons, though at great cost to his own soul due to the weight of karmic debt. This causes Xiao much suffering, which Zhongli tries to ease indirectly by having Traveler pass on this powerful pain medication called Remedium Tertiorum to the Vigilant Yaksha. Now, as for Ganyu, Zhongli's voice lines state that she was the first to sign a contract with him, though the exact dates are still kind of wonky since Ganyu says this happened 3,000 years ago. Meanwhile, Zhongli mentions how the first Adepti to sign contracts was over 3,700 years ago. But, I mean, Ganyu is kind of forgetful, right? And with that aside, Ganyu has absolute faith in all Rex Lapis does, and her primary motivation for working so hard and making self-improvements is actually the example he's set in prioritizing Liu Wei's welfare. She voices how she wants to live up to his standards, but gets more overwhelmed the more mistakes she makes. So you know, I can't help but feel relieved for Ganyu that Rex Lapis stepped down, since hopefully now she won't feel the need to compare herself so much. But on another note, I'm under the impression that Ganyu doesn't know Zhongli is Rex Lapis, right? I mean, her voice lines not mentioning him by the former of those names is such a contrast to Xiao, who rather meekly asks what Zhongli has been doing nowadays. The way she talks about Rex Lapis in front of Zhongli during the Archon quest just further suggests she is unaware in my book, since I don't think it's in her personality to feign ignorance that well. 
But those are just my thoughts on the matter, so I'd love to hear any theories and or other info I may have missed that supports the opposite, that Ganyu is actually in the know about Zhongli's real identity. Now, Cloud Retainer's other disciple, Shen He, definitely finds it interesting that Zhongli claims to be a mortal, yet is very familiar with her master. Nevertheless, she completely obeys Cloud Retainer's orders to not disturb the man whenever he stops by to sit down for a drink in front of her abode. Now, turning to all the other mortals in Liyue, it should come as no surprise that this section is gonna be long, starting with the Qixing. Keqing has been a skeptic of Rex Lapis for a long time, simply because she doesn't want Liyue to stagnate by over-relying on him. Though as for Zhongli, like we've seen in the Archon Quest, he actually found her views very refreshing when he first heard them at one of the Rites of Descension. In fact, he never truly would have considered stepping down from his Archon duties if it wasn't for people like Keqing. And ever since he's done just that, the Yuhong herself has developed a great respect for Rex Lapis even becoming a closet fan who's accumulated a ton of collectible memorabilia at this point. And speaking of respect, Zhongli has a great deal of that for Ningguang as well, seeing as nothing ever stops her. He still remembers back in the days when she walked barefoot from Yaoguang Shoal all the way to the South Wharf, peddling what wares she could. As for Ningguang, she can definitely see that this Zhongli fellow is well-versed in many affairs. She just hasn't considered making him a pawn though, since she still can't spot any weaknesses. Though funny thing is, it clearly has to do with Mora and his lack of it, which is something she has a lot of. But let's talk about Child briefly too, since he was a major star in the Archon quest. The Harbinger is still peeved over having been fooled by Zhongli, so in an ever childlike fashion, he thinks the only way for him to make up for it is to have a fierce duel. Meanwhile, Zhongli throws such shade at the youngster, calling him a rascal that he can easily deal with at any time if necessary. Nevertheless, he knows that things are anything but uninteresting whenever a child is involved, so surely there will be much more about him in the rumor mill in the future. There are so many others Zhongli has indirectly influenced simply by being Rex Lapis as well. For example, Beidou's favorite childhood lullaby told of the legendary Rex Lapis smiting sea monsters, something she dreamed of doing on her own someday. For Yunjin, she was raised on the stories of Rex Lapis and the other Adepti, since those are the most popularly depicted tales in traditional Liyue opera. Additionally, Yunjin deeply values learning about the origins of the particular customs in opera from Mr. Zhang Li. The Wangshang Funeral Parlor Consultant was also one to give Xinyan's music a chance back when no one really believed in the power of rock and roll yet in Liyue. She sure couldn't get behind performing at a funeral parlor though. And Sean Ling, a pioneer of her own craft, never ceases to be amazed at Mr. Zhang Li's incredibly precise palette. He's able to tell not only what ingredients she uses, but the locations she sources them from, all via just a single bite of her cooking. Xing Cho and Chong Yun too can tell that this Mr. Zhong Li is an incredible person, especially since he's trusted to do something as sacred as burying the Adepti. Now moving on to Yan Fei, her most prized possession is the steel yard balance her father gave her, which he in turn received from Rex Lapis. By the way, Yanfei has part adeptal blood like Ganyu does. Anyway, this treasure can be used to measure the value of all things, so Yanfei uses Mora to balance the scales for convenience sake, which echoes a certain story quest, huh? She admires Mr. Zhongli as a total savant and walking library as well, 
but also can't shake the feeling that she knows him from somewhere else. Her adeptus father sure was evasive when she asked him about it, though. Meanwhile, Zhongli himself sure is proud of Yanfei, whom upholds order in Liyue in her own way despite never having signed a contract with him. He's sure her father would be even prouder than he is. And at last, we've arrived at his boss, Hu Tao, the director of the Wangsheng Funeral Parlor. They definitely poke a bit of fun at each other in a very familial kind of way, like Grandpa Zhongli not being able to keep up with Hu Tao's liveliness all the time, while the young lady herself finds his personality a bit dusty. But even so, Zhongli is the person she trusts the most, which is just super wholesome to hear considering how much she loved her already departed grandfather. But of course, we can't forget to mention Zhongli's fellow Archons, starting with the only other remaining of the original seven, Barbados. Zhongli definitely makes a show of being exasperated by Venti's constant drinking and how it takes away from his musical talents, but based on what we've already discussed earlier on, he truly does value Venti's friendship throughout the many years. Venti also pokes fun at the Geo blockhead, but wants the traveler to take along the next time he goes to visit with a bottle of wine. As for the current Electro Archon, the two clearly don't seem very close. A herself says she's only met him once at a feast, while she was still just a Kagemisha, or in other words, a body double. She sees that he's made his choice regarding his Archon status yet also believes his story is far from over. Meanwhile, Zhongli does want to know what exactly this idea of eternity means to her, that she'd be willing to sacrifice her people for it. Now, as for some other miscellaneous things, I can now talk about why Zhongli, who seems to have an interest in everything, actually has a severe aversion to seafood. Turns out this unexpected creature from back during the Archon War has completely traumatized him to this very day. This creature had agile tentacles that could live on even after being cut off, and secreted this revolting thick fluid. But no, that wasn't even the worst of it. The true monstrosity of this creature was its incredibly small size that let it escape into the smallest nooks and crannies. You see, unfortunately for Morax, he agreed to wipe out these creatures at the behest of Liyue's people. But these small creatures couldn't be destroyed in the same way he could pierce literal gods with stone spears on the battlefield. No. He had to endure this long campaign of pest extermination, having to reach in and grab these slimy creatures one by one in order to banish them, since he is the god of contracts after all, and he had an agreement to fulfill to his people. This is why, to this day, Zhongli refuses to eat seafood unless it's been sliced and diced to oblivion, like seafood tofu. But on another note, if we can go back to the era pre-Archon War, it's actually heavily implied that Guizhong and Zhongli were romantically involved. Or at the very least, Zhongli held feelings for her, which is how the Primordial Jade Cutter comes into play. So apparently, he carved this sword for her, but was tragically unable to give it as a gift before she passed away. I mean, Gwaili Assembly is literally a combination of their names, and though we still don't know for sure what Zhongli's name was all the way back then, the Li character in Zhongli is the same as the one in Gwaili Plains. Or well, let's say it was just a purely platonic friendship. Even then, it clearly meant a lot to both of them. So part of me can get behind how Morax going on to slay all the other gods during the Archon War could have been partly for vengeance sake. But speaking of Guizhong, I always like the community theory that she was more the brains to Morax's brawn, 
Which brings me to a criticism I've encountered here and there about how Zhang Li is too perfect or like Gary Stu levels. And to that, I'd respond that that's essentially the point of his character and where he's at in his journey of life. In other words, he's lived for thousands of years. If anything, he should be at that point in his life that he's learned a lot from past mistakes and is now just an older, wiser person. It's not like he's some high school aged kid who somehow still has the wisdom of a sage. We also still don't know much about the more sus past incidents in Tabat's history that he's been around to see, so who knows? There is potential for us to learn of Zhongli's mistakes and or character prior to becoming the experienced and wise person he is today. Also, just on a personal note, Zhongli is a character I definitely relate to and how he just accepts that all good moments come and go. That's just the natural order of life. And that's why it's so important to just enjoy the present moment as it is and cherish the memories that are made. So like, if you know me from my other channel, you know that my favorite of the Persona games is P3. And essentially the exact message that Zhongli encapsulates is the core theme of said game. So out of all the characters in Genshin so far, I definitely want to break down what I love about Zhongli's character and his life philosophy at some point. It'll be linked somewhere in the cards when I eventually get to it. But anyway, there's still so much potential to Zhongli's story, such as what's gonna happen now that Mora is no longer being minted ever since he gave his Gnosis away. So overall, I just love to hear any ideas and or theory crafting you might have about Zhongli's future in Genshin. But wow, my goodness, this video was so long. You would think I wouldn't be so surprised considering he's an Archon and understandably so connected to the lore. But anyway, please like this video if you liked it and subscribe for more of this series. All update videos I do for Zhongli in the future will be linked in the pinned comment below, by the way. Finally, just a heads up, you can join our very welcoming and active Discord community at discord.gg slash ladyvirgilia. Plus, if you happen to like the Trails and or Persona series, I have a whole separate channel dedicated to those games, so check that out if you wish.